Okay, we will review this book, How to Teach Quantum Physics to Your Dog, by Chad Orzel. And I thought this would be like a really simplistic book, but it's actually very sophisticated and an excellent overview of um, quantum physics in the standard um, understanding. Um, so I highly recommend it in terms of understanding quantum physics as mainstream science. But on uh, page 148, he goes into non-locality and he says it's as profound and disturbing as the issues discussed in chapter 3 and chapter 4 um, now he's talking about non-locality in terms of the Bohmian model of um, quantum physics but he really doesn't go into the Bohmian model um, in detail at all. And he just says how it came up in terms of the um, Bell's inequality experiment. And then um, He focuses on uh, quantum uncertainty to destruct, to um, explain virtual antimatter, and and then he goes on to explain how when you define a frequency, it takes a certain unit of time to measure the frequency and this is the basis for the uncertainty principle of time and frequency that then is converted to time and energy and then the energy is converted to mass so you essentially have uncertainty in your mass through that original time uh, frequency uncertainty and so he starts off the book talking about how a wave is defined as a continuous um, function of time. And so when you have a wave, um, you get diffraction, whereas a particle is defined basically by the because the wavelength is so small that the time unit to measure it does not, of the energy, does not allow diffraction. And so in terms of the Bohmian physics um, model, what they, what I discussed with uh, Professor Basil G. Hiley, as he says that the the wave function as it is shown here was a good this this is a wave function that that combines the uncertainty of a particle with the wave property and he says that that is the algorithm that's been used for mainstream quantum physics and it's worked as an algorithm, but the problem is, is that it, it ignores this non-local ontology of reality. And so what um, this book argues is that the non-locality is, um, it's not real because the, the bells 
inequality relies on a randomization of the polarization. And so because you have to randomize the polarization, there's no way you can send any kind of information as a signal, even though the um, even though the correlation is instantaneous, and that's why it's non-local. So he's saying that that non-locality is as challenging as the chapter three and four of this book, but the problem is, is because he's relying on the defining a um, wave as a continuous magnitude that's symmetric, then he doesn't um, he doesn't acknowledge the non-commutativity that's inherent um, to the non-locality before any measurement takes place, and that's what the essence of the Bohmian model is: is that it predicts the um, particle and momentum at the same time instantaneously um, from the future and the past uh, combined together um, by relying on the non-commutativity. And so essentially with the non-commutativity you're using a discrete um, number um, reality before space-time exists and so how they explain it in the matrices is that the it's the non-diagonal of the matrices so he doesn't even get into matrices at all in this book and and so when you have the non-diagonal of the matrices there was um an excellent uh fellow on youtube who he was getting his um PhD in quantum physics, and he explains how when you have the um, non-diagonal of the matrices, those those numbers that are not diagonal are they are not the particle, but they are they are still the non-local. Um, they still have a non-local instantaneous um, information with the with the particle before the particle exists, before any measurement takes place. And so here you have the um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and it's defined by this um, 4 pi, which would be the sphere. But the um, what the problem is, is that Planck, when Planck created his definition of a constant he was inspired by equal tempered music tuning and so he determined an average um, energy of light uh, defined by joules and in order and to do that he inherently defined the energy as a um, symmetric uh, time value unit in order to convert the energy into a magnitude for density as joules. And when he did that, he canceled out one of the cycles of the time. Um, and so you just get this frequency without the time and therefore you lose the relativity that's inherent to the um, De Broglie-Einstein relation that De Broglie later discovered, and so um, essentially that the when you combine the um, frequency times um, wavelength um, or frequency times Planck's constant um, equals the mass times the speed of light squared. So um, uh, Professor Basil J. Basil J. Hiley's um, big point is that you have to use um, h squared or h bar squared, and when you this is 
this essentially is um, that bypasses the uncertainty principle because the H bar is already assuming this um, collapse of the four four pi into a, a measurement. Um, so when you use h bar squared, you get what they call it a quantum quantum blob. And so the particle as a quantum blob actually has a um, an average of the future and the past overlapping. And since it's before the particle exists, it's a it's what creates the non-locality itself. So um so for example he gets into the um he gets into the quantum uh, teleportation but he doesn't mention the the model that my own quantum physics professor developed um, Herbert J Bernstein which is the what he calls the donut but it's actually this non commutative torus and the that's he just calls it a donut because that's easier for people to you know the torus is a donut but the reason he uses the donut as the mathematical model is because it's you get a extra magnitude as the inherent uh, intrinsic um, spin being one half and so when you have that one half spin that's why you have the the uncertainty of the sphere with the four pi is due to the 720 degree um geometry that's necessary for the in order to measure the location of the particle um for one half spin but because of relativity the photon has a gravitational mass that's converted to the electron so the one half spin of the electron is actually it's actually due to the fact that the gravitational mass of the of the photon um is inherently uh, non-commutative with this future in the past overlapping um, and that's what creates the electron and this is what um, John G Williamson also focused on with his work with uh, Martin Van Vandermark who um, wrote a paper with um, Gerard de Hooft who has the uh, eternal black hole model that that the eternal black hole is actually the truth, the truth of the origin of space time of the universe. And it's due to, again, this, this gravitational mass of the photon is what creates matter in the first place. And since it's, there's no center of, you can't assume a symmetric center of the magnitude to create the mass of, the, of a particle and therefore you inherently always have this non-local active information before space-time exists and the f and because it's dis because it's discrete therefore it's not a random um, polarization because the polarization assumes a classical magnitude already of the of the process but the intrinsic magnitude of the spin is discrete and therefore the mathematics is actually the one half spin is the time and frequency as a discrete um overlap of the future and the past and this is found in what Alan Kahn calls two three infinity meaning that the definition of frequency is no longer assumed to be a symmetric magnitude of geometry as space-time that's continuous 
but rather the definition of frequency is defined by a discrete time process or dynamic that is non-local of the future and the past overlapping. The reason he calls this 2, 3, infinity because it's found in basic music theory. And this was covered up at the origin of Western science when irrational geometric magnitude was first uh, created from the wrong, wrong music theory. And so the non-locality is the truth of what in non-Western philosophy is called non-dualism as the oneness, but the oneness is a process of the three as two, three, infinity. So it's non, non-duality, non-dualism. It's what uh, Ramana Maharshi called the undifferentiated uh, triad. So the two, three, infinity is described as a discrete um, geometry or non-commutative geometry based on the ratios being non-commutative so when you have uh, the one you define it with a geometric ratio so in like in music theory you typically you, you'd say the one is a c and so the octave is also a c as the same pitch um, but that process then creates a, the, the third frequency of three as a natural overtone and undertone, but the resonance of the overtone and undertone as three is non-commutative because as the undertone, it's an F as two thirds and as the overtone is G as three halves. And so that's what creates this infinite, discrete, non-local process. It's very simple, but it's a very radical insight from non-Western music theory. And so that process is explained by the matrices, mathematics that this book doesn't even get into at all. And so then... Um, because it's, uh, it can't be explained by a wave that's continuous, therefore it cannot be visualized inherently. And so he, in this book, he defines uh, time as a, something that you watch or an external measurement as an observation. And therefore you have an inherent uncertainty based on the um, the process of measurement itself but what um, and from that definition of time then he dismisses uh, any kind of quantum medicine or quantum the ba the application of quantum physics to to biology as um, quantum healing and but Basil J. Hiley says that if you understand non-commutativity then that completely changes quantum biology because it enables the quantum coherence to self amplify into the macro scale because non-commutativity is not limited to the micro scale because you, you no longer have a quantum measurement problem as the collapse of a wave function because you're not using the wave function anymore. And so in the very final chapter of this book, he dismisses, you know, any kind of quantum biology or quantum healing as um, woo-woo. But if you understand that the definition of the one itself is based on logical inference, of the future and the past overlapping as a discrete uh, non-local process of number then the non-commutativity bypasses this dismissal of uh, quantum healing as being woo-woo and this is what um, Eddie 
oceans figured out when he worked at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, and he coined the phrase quantum psychology while he also taught Nei Gong, um, or he taught uh, Wing Chun as Nei Gong, but he realized that all the internal martial arts and yoga, um, non-Western meditation is actually based on the secret of non-commutativity. And that's what makes it a viable um, explanation of the quantum, um, what he called the Tao of physics as quantum healing in uh, psychology, but also for mind-body integration as practiced in uh, Nei Gong or internal martial arts. <clears throat> so in terms of the standard physics, this is an excellent book. I mean, it, it describes everything very, very well. And he, he uses his, you know, relationship with his dog as kind of like the layperson explanation. But he just splices that in along with the his like sophisticated science analysis. Um, but at the same time, he's not, he's ignoring the deeper uh, non-commutative analysis that it has to be confronted due to the non-locality of the um, Bell's inequality experiment that disproved Einstein's dismissal of what was called spooky action at a distance. And Einstein realized that this would explain um, telepathy if it was true, the spooky action at a distance. And so the, here he's getting into the quantum teleportation and so we can say that the the um, the entanglement is already he's he's relying on the standard definition of entanglement being something that you have to construct that it's very fragile but that's not true in um, non commutativity in non commutativity the entanglement exists before any measurement takes place as non-locality. And so, as Basil J. Hiley explained to me, he doesn't believe in any kind of um, symmetric um, rest frame that relativity assumes has to exist for a measurement to take place. Um... So it just shows that if you go deeper into the philosophy of science, then it, it does radically change your understanding of um, quantum physics as well as um, science as a whole. And so here he is getting into the definition of frequency. So it, if you're when you're meditating, you're not relying on an external measurement as observation, but you're rather relying on listening as a logical inference. And so, in the quantum biology research of um, Roger Penrose and Stuart Hamroff, they've realized that precognition is actually the foundation of consciousness of reality before any observation takes place and through that process um, they've discovered that ultrasound is the strongest uh, quantum coherence frequency of the microtubule with the tubulin as a uh, negative refractive index so that you get a non-local super radiance and So this was actually um, proven recently again where they did an experiment with the 
wave function of the photon in, as a weak measurement entanglement, and they discovered that there is indeed a superluminal um, signal, a superluminal um, correlation inherent to the emission and absorption of the photon. But they said that because it exists within the wave function itself, um, that it can never be used to send a signal. But what they're, they're assuming the wrong definition of the wave function as a continuous symmetric magnitude. But if you understand the inherent uh, non-commutativity of the wave function, <clears throat> this is what I, I, I dubbed the Hempel effect because in um, there's a book called The Magic of the Senses and they explain how is it, if you change the frequency of the overtones and the undertones, then you change the, the amplitude of a wave and normally because if you observe and look at the the wave function as an, an external measurement it would you would have to have a different uh, sound to the frequency because the amplitude has been changed and it's the same with the probability because you're assuming a squaring of the um, wave function to get the particle to exist with a location and when you square it you have to rule out the negative frequency and by ruling out the negative frequency you lose the non-commutative truth of reality <clears throat> and so the when you have the discrete um, interference of the wave uh, that's inherent to the resonance of the one then the <clears throat> the two and the three are heard as the same perfect fifth. Um, and another way to explain this is that <clears throat> there's a, there's an inherently no perfect fourth as a natural overtone. <clears throat> the uh, perfect fourth only exists if you assume the symmetric magnitude of the wave function. But when you rely on listening as logical inference, there is no perfect fourth and as an overtone. And instead, it creates a new one as an undertone octave of the same pitch. And because of that, the um, perfect fourth is therefore defined as the time-reversed undertone of the one that's non-commutative. And so that's why the perfect fourth is the, if you use like in the terms of geometry, if you use C as the one, and then F would be the perfect fifth undertone as two thirds. And the, the perfect fourth is therefore uh, four thirds based on the doubling, but the only, so anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that.